Hi everyone, Tim here with the monthly solar and energy stats for August 2023. So we have a 6.8 kilowatt peak array split east and west, 3.4 kilowatts on each side, combined with 14.7 kilowatt hours of give energy battery storage, that's a 9.5 and a 5.2 kilowatt hour battery, coupled to a 5 kilowatt Gen 2 hybrid inverter. So with that out of the way, let's get on with the stats. So after last month's stats video, one of my viewers commented that they really liked the uh, reports that you can generate from the Give Energy web portal. Now I'd not used this before, um, so I thought I'd give it a go uh, this month and I'll show you what it looks like. And I really like it, so uh, I might keep using these in the future. So let me know what you think. So basically, when you're on the web portal, if you go to the little bar on the side here and you go down to uh, reports, it brings up this page where you can generate reports of different types. So the one I'm going to show you today is the monthly report. Now you just pick the, the relevant month, so we want August for this uh, particular video, and generate report. Now it takes a few seconds to generate, but once it's done that, um, it'll pop up and uh, yeah, here we go. So what you get is this nicely formatted report with lots of interesting charts and information. Um, but basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to start about halfway down um, with the solar generation. And you can see I generated 627.6 kilowatt hours in August, which is not actually that much less than we generated in uh, July. And that just goes to show how rubbish July was. As it turns out, um, August was more or less on par um, with what you would expect. So I'm going to show you um, the monthly uh, breakdown uh, throughout the last uh, few months later. But um, yeah, this was really interesting. Um, I thought initially that this wasn't going to be a great month, but actually it turned out to be more or less exactly what you would expect for our array uh, at this time of year. Um, so you can see also that we uh, actually consumed uh, 501 kilowatt hours on the, uh, the, the home daily chart here. And uh, yeah, so less than we generated, which is good. So a lot of that will be things like charging of the EV overnight and also heating our hot water, which we, we also do overnight during the cheap octopus flux period. So we actually used 124.8 kilowatt hours for our hot water and 117 kilowatt hours for the EV, which accounts for about half of the uh, daily consumption um, for the month of August. And then if I scroll a little bit further down, you can see what we actually uh, consumed and exported uh, to and from the grid. So you can see that we imported a total of 382 kilowatt hours. So that's all the stuff overnight during the octopus flux off peak period, heating the hot water and charging the EV. And we exported 474 kilowatt hours uh, back to the grid. Now, a lot of that was during the flux peak period. That's forced discharging the battery between 5 and 7 p.m. Um, but also there's a lot of uh, excess solar that uh, was also exporting um, before that, so during the day, um, because the battery would be full by about midday and then the, um, the, any excess solar then gets exported back to the grid as well. So then if I scroll back up to the top, there's this really interesting energy flow graph, which I really like. Uh, you can see this is the sort of various different components of the energy that went into the house and what we then consumed. So you can see here the solar generation was 627 kilowatt hours. We imported 382 kilowatt hours from the grid and we consumed 293 uh, 0.9 kilowatt hours from the battery and you can see that the different components of that go into the home where we consumed 501 kilowatt hours charging the battery from the grid and solar 328 kilowatt hours and exporting to the grid 474 kilowatt hours uh, most of which went from solar but a good chunk went from the battery so this is a really interesting way of visualizing the energy flow i think it helps you sort of understand what proportion goes where and i really like that i think i'm going to um, use this in the future so uh, expect to see this in the, in the coming months and if you want to see that in a slightly different way you've got this other energy flow chart over on the left hand side here it's got basically the same information but uh, showed uh, shown with the values rather than this nice sort of uh, flow chart here now in the top middle here, we have this thing that reports your self-consumption. Now I don't think this is particularly useful for us because I'm deliberately charging up the battery overnight um, a little bit and then um, ex force exporting some of that back to the grid uh, during the flux peak period. So um, really this isn't, a, isn't super helpful um, because I'm not really trying to maximize my self-consumption. I think if the flux export rate wasn't so good, I would obviously try to maximize this. But because the flux export rate is so high, I'm actually deliberately trying to export a lot and not use um, all of the solar. So yeah, this isn't particularly useful for me, but um, for some people that might be really interesting and something to keep an eye on. 
Uh, what is interesting to me is actually these values here. Uh, I'm not too bothered by this value, this um, one that says consumption would have cost us £89 um, because uh, I've got a, a more useful and detailed calculation that I do myself. Um, but these values here actually do tally exactly with what um, I calculate. So the export rate, um, the import rate and the overall uh, actually does uh, tally with uh, with what I calculate. So you can see here that we've we in August we received an income of fifty five pounds fifty five. That doesn't account for the standing charge. So actually, it's a little bit less than that. Um, but I'll show you all of that um, at the end of the video. So something new I'd like to show this month is this monthly comparison of what we generated versus what we expected to generate. So you can see here well, I've got a distribution in blue showing what we expect to generate uh, versus what we did generate in 2023 from April onwards. So we had our uh, array installed late March, so I'm not going to show the March stats because I don't think that's super useful to show only a week's worth of generation for March. Um, but all the full month, months from April onwards um, I've shown in this chart. Now, uh, you may ask, well, how did I get the expected generation? Now, let me show you what uh, what I did. So those of you who follow Gary from Gary Does Solar on his channel, uh, you may be familiar with this particular website. This is the Photovoltaic Geographical Information System. So I use this to set up the two parts of my uh, solar array, um, east and west, uh, just using these uh, boxes here. I'm not going to go into exactly um, how I did all that. You can see that on Gary's video. I'll put a link up in the, uh, in the corner. Um, if you want to uh, learn how to do that for your own array. And what I then did was I basically just downloaded the uh, the CSV file uh, using this button here, and that tells you all of the data um, for each month for each part of your array. And you can then, what I did was I combined those two together into the chart that I showed uh, a second ago. So let's go back to that chart and I'll walk you through it. So this shaded blue area is what we expected to generate each month. So that's basically just the average uh, from one month to the next. If you take a whole load of, uh, of years of generation, this is what it would average out to if you added up all those months and divided it by the total number of months. The additional lines above and below that shaded area um, I've labeled as plus and minus one standard deviation. So what do I mean by a standard deviation? So this is a mathematical term that just describes the amount of variation you would expect from um, a sample of values. So let's take um, the August uh, value for example here. Uh, so you can see this, this central blue line, we actually generated very, very close to what the expected generation was for um, for August. So yeah, it turns out that, um, that we generated basically uh, what we expected. Um, however, you've got these lines above and below, one standard deviation either side. So if you take all of the historical months going back many, many years, and you said, right, what would we expect to generate in each of those months, you'd get a distribution. It wouldn't always be this value here. It would be sometimes a bit above, sometimes a bit, a bit below. You can see these other months here, they're often either below or above the line, and I'll, I'll go into those in a second. Um, but yeah, typically, how much would you expect it to vary one year to the next? And one standard deviation is a good way of describing how much you would typically expect that variation to be um, from one, one August in one year to an August the next year and the year after and so on. So one standard deviation, um, that means uh, you would normally expect about two-thirds of... Uh, each August in every year to fall somewhere between these two lines. If you want to learn more about standard deviations, I suggest uh, doing a Google search. You'll probably bring up some uh, some good Wikipedia pages to describe everything about it. Um, but yeah, what this means is most of the time you should expect the generation to fall within those two lines. The rest of the time, the, the one third that doesn't fall within these lines, you'd expect it to fall outside. So either above the plus one standard deviation or um, below the minus one standard deviation. Uh, so in fact, um, what you'll find is that it is, it is possible, although rare, for uh, values to fall more than two or even three standard deviations away uh, from the expectation, the expected value here. So you could see, for example, August way up here near 750 kilowatt hours, or it could be way down here at 500, 500 kilowatt hours instead of uh, what we actually saw, which was somewhere in the middle. Uh, now, you can see going back into May and June in particular, these two were exceptionally good months. So May was very nearly, actually slightly more than two standard deviations more than you would expect for a typical May based on our array and position in the, in the UK and all that. So yeah, May was really exceptional. And in fact, uh, I think the fact that it was about two standard deviations away suggests that you'd only get uh, a month like this um, once every 
let's say, I can't remember what it is now, something something in the region of one, once every 20 years, something like that. Uh, if I'm wrong, I'll put up a little uh, text box in the, uh, in the, in the corner. And uh, similarly with June, um, that was about one and a half standard deviations more than you would expect for a typical June. Um, but you can see for July, we were just below minus one standard deviation, lower than, than expected. So uh, yeah, this was an exception, not, not an exceptionally low July, but an unusually low J July, shall we say. Whereas April, you know, it's roughly what we'd expect, slightly lower than the expectation, but certainly well within the, the plus or minus one standard deviation lines there. So yeah, just putting these lines on gives you an idea of how unusual a particular month is. May, June, very very uh, much higher than you would expect. August, pretty much bang on. So yeah, there you go. I thought that might be interesting to show you and I'll uh, continue to add the, the months as we go through through the year and uh, into uh, into the winter. So yeah, uh, so far September has been really interesting uh, as you probably are aware from the last week's worth of extremely hot and sunny weather. Uh, but let's see how the rest of that month goes. And uh, yeah, so let's move on to the savings that we made for this month. So August actually was surprisingly similar to July in terms of savings, although the distribution was slightly different. So uh, we actually um, imported a little bit more uh, than we did uh, in uh, July, um, and we also exported a little bit less than we did in July, which meant that the total electric bill um, was minus £39.35 uh, in August compared to minus £50 in July. So a little bit less uh, uh, earnings, but um, we actually drove the um, our electric vehicle a bit more in uh, August than we did in July, which means that uh, we saved a bit more. Uh, it's one of those weird things that, you know, because we're obviously charging uh, our car during the off-peak period, uh, the off-peak flux period, and um, that means that the more we drive, the more we save um, because uh, running the EV um, charging from home using off-peak power is obviously significantly less than it would be if we'd filled up an equivalent ICE car uh, internal combustion engine for those who don't know what ice means um, uh, using petrol so uh, we saved um, in total 218 pounds this month compared to about 212 pounds in July so uh, for those of you who haven't seen uh, these uh, calculations before what I've done is I've basically stripped out uh, the EV and the hot water heating uh, from uh, our energy use and then anything left over that we would normally have used so just our standard base load power and all the uh, appliances and other stuff um, I calculate what that would have cost us using the standard um, octopus flexible electric tariff and then um, I've assumed that any uh, electric vehicle charging we would have used um, petrol instead for for our previous car which was a Honda Jazz and any hot water that we um, heated using uh, immersion heating over the off-peak period for, for uh, using the flux off-peak period we would have done using gas instead so um, I've then added up the gas and the electric from the standard flux tariff uh, combined with the uh, the internal combustion engine car cost and that's what it would have cost us and then I've taken the difference between that and the total uh, electric bill for um, Octopus Flux, which was minus £39 in this particular instance. And that gives you the total of £218 uh, for the savings for August. So there you go. Um, that was uh, quite interesting um, that um, despite the fact that uh, the distribution was slightly different, uh, the total savings were very, very similar. So another thing that I've done actually this month is I, I because uh, it's coming up to the time of year when I'm going to be thinking about changing from using the flux tariff to switching to uh, Octopus Go, um, then I thought, well, what would our, let's hypothetically, what would our cost have been uh, if we'd been on Octopus Go in August? Um, in addition to that, I thought, well, Although we can't actually get Octopus Intelligent because we don't have the, the right EV charger or the right car to, to get that tariff, if we did, what would our um, consumption have been, what would our bill have been if we'd been on Intelligent Octopus instead? So um, here you go. Here's the, here's the comparison of the three different uh, tariffs. Obviously, lots of caveats here. But uh, Flux, we obviously say saved £218. If we'd been on Intelligent Octopus... Uh, in August, that would have saved us two hundred and five pounds eighty five eighty five pence, and if we'd been on Go, we would have saved one hundred and forty six pounds fifty. So, uh, if we'd been on Go, we definitely wouldn't have used the uh, the consumption pattern and export pattern that we did because the um, export tariff for Go is only four point one. Uh, pence per kilowatt hour so there's definitely no way we would have charged up the battery and then forced exported that during during the peak period so that value is 
you know, not really representative, if I'm honest. So you can basically ignore the Go one. However, if we were on Intelligent Octopus, they've recently switched the um, export tariff to um, their sort of standard outgoing uh, instead of the smart export guarantee. So instead of receiving 4.1 pence per kilowatt hour, you can now receive 15 pence, 1.5, 15 pence per kilowatt hour exporting when you're on the intelligent uh, tariff, intelligent uh, octopus tariff. So uh, if you want to learn more about this, I suggest you watch uh, Danny V. Solar's video that he released recently um, explaining all about that. Um, but yeah, this is really interesting. Um, it, I'm, I'm kind of annoyed that I can't get intelligent octopus at the moment um i suppose i could if i got an omi charger i think i could uh, get intelligent um octopus however i'm still waiting for the uh the give energy ev charger and i'm hoping that that might also be compatible with intelligent um octopus at some point in the future i will be asking um give energy and octopus if that's going to be the case i'm hoping it is because that would be the ideal situation for us because if we could switch to intelligent instead of go that would make um the winter savings that much better because the overnight rate is a lot less than than go so i think it's seven and a half pence for intelligence and um i think it's 9.5 pence for go so you save a little bit more um, by charging up uh, you know your battery and all that stuff overnight uh, on intelligent compared to go uh, but uh, the other advantage of intelligent is that you get six hours instead of four of the off-peak period which would really help um you know filling up the battery which would then enable us to support our heating for for the day and it might even then enable us to get a bigger battery you know add an additional 5.2 or 9.5 kilowatt hours to our battery system which would then support all of the heating instead of just most of the heating so that's something to to bear in mind um lots of things to think about in the future i think we'll be switching probably in october we shall see um obviously initially to go but let's see if we're able to switch to intelligent later in the winter um modulo you know whether or not the uh, the uh, give energy ev charger is compatible with intelligent or not we shall see all of that uh, to be determined but yeah thanks very much for watching if you found this useful please uh, use my referral code for for octopus if you're not already with octopus um or you know feel free to buy us a coffee if you like there's a link to that in the description um if you just want to contribute to to, to help support the channel that would be really appreciated but yeah thanks for watching i'll catch you in the next one